Today, I'll be speaking with Susan Nagel. Susan has her Bachelor of Science degree in Biology, Chemistry, and Medical Technology, and a Master's degree in Nonprofit Administration. After her retirement, she focused her time on art. She has studied with Jim Sherbarth, Rebecca Crowell, and Pam Coffey. She works in an oil and cold wax method of painting and is a member of the Art on the Plaza Gallery. She splits her time between Iowa and Arizona. Hello, Susan. Uh, thank you for joining me today to have a conversation about your art practice and your creativity. So I think we will jump right in. And why don't you tell us about the uh, oil paint and cold wax painting method um, that you do? Well, thank you for having me, Jeffrey. It's really a pleasure. And um, it's humbling. So um, I, as you said, I paint with oil and cold wax. And um, the oil paint is just regular oil paint from any artist's studio. Um, the cold wax is different. It is a, it looks like um, lard or butter consistency. It is beeswax with resin and a solvent. And um, you mix that 50-50 uh, or different proportions, depending on what you want, uh, with oil paint. And you use that, it's a little more structural at that point, it gets uh, more like a butter. And um, I use um, wood panel that I paint on. And um, I don't use brushes. I use all kinds of tools and the oil and cold wax um, is spread over these panels in various ways and you can achieve textures, you can add lines to it, you can put sand in it, you can put powders. And so it's sort of sculptural and painting at the same time. I've told you I loved finger painting as a child and so um, Oil and cold wax really speaks to me in that way. And I am what I consider a reductionist in the oil and cold wax world and others are additive type of painters. I build up on those wood panels, maybe 30, 40 layers of paint. And at different times I am scraping back, dissolving back, getting different textures, different things in different areas of my painting. Some people, do more adding, 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 adding to the finished product. I'm always going deep and looking for that history that's there. So it's a different method. All the rules of oil painting go out the window, but um, there are, are certainly techniques and styles of oil and cold wax. How did you become interested in this technique? Well, when I decided to retire about five years ago, I was working at NIAC, I decided to retire and I knew I needed to have a plan because I love working and I am not good at sitting home. And so I needed to decide what was I going to do for my, my next life. And I have always painted and I wanted to put some more effort and time into my paintings. I've painted in watercolor, oil, acrylic, mixed media, all of the different uh, mediums and did some clay work, glass work, and just love the creative process. But um, I decided I wanted to paint in oils and paint more painterly, um, not tight realistic painting, but more painterly painting. So I went up to Northrop King and um, in Minneapolis and uh, went into all the artist studios there. Many of them teach. And I looked for an artist whose paintings I just really loved. And I found several with the painterly approach and um, signed up for classes, Saturday classes. But in the meantime, I also walked into Jim Sherbart's studio and it was all abstract. And I like abstract, but it wasn't a, any area I wanted to go into, but his work just really spoke to me. It was very deep. There had such a sense of history in every painting and you look deeper and every time you looked, you saw some other mark 
or something. And Jim talked to me and explained it was oil and cold wax. And I took his card and on the way home from Minneapolis, I thought about it and I, I had asked Jim who he learned from and it was Rebecca Kroll from Wisconsin. So I called them or texted them both and asked for classes and um, signed up one in February. I retired in January. I took one of their classes in February, one in March, and I've been painting oil and cold wax ever since. So, um, and I was fortunate, both Jim and Rebecca are world renowned oil and cold wax painters. Rebecca's written the Bible on oil and cold wax and they, they teach Iceland, Paris, Ireland, all over. Uh, how about you share a little bit about your process of working? How do you begin a painting? What things um, go into it uh, in making a work? Um, when I start a painting, I usually have in my mind uh, a color palette. And I have in my mind uh, a theme, sort of um, either I'm thinking about the water or I'm thinking about uh, death in my family. I've had that happen. I'm thinking about um, positive thought, it, whatever. Because when I paint, it's really meditative for me and my emotions come out. And so I start, I choose my panel and I always write something on it. And what I write on it, I never keep or write down. I just, it's sort of my intention for that beginning. So it could be love and friendship. It might have something to do with loss. It might have just to do with world events, whatever. But the paintings are all really my emotions coming out. Uh, for instance, I, I, I lost a very dear friend to cancer. And so I poured myself into some paintings and um, it, they were called Crossing Over. And so, you know, that was written underneath. I remember that one. And so the whole process was just that spiritual area. And sometimes I do that and sometimes it's something more light, but it's always my emotion coming through and I paint just for me. Do you have other um, subjects or outside things that influence your process or uh, inform your painting? Yes, you know, I do. Um, nature, I'm a, I'm a science, I have a science background and I love the microscopic and that's probably why I was so drawn to oil and cold wax because it's so microscopic in feel. And I love that and nature as well influences my um, color choices and my palette. But I also am really drawn to people. Oh, and faces, forms. And so I'm trying to incorporate that more now, more figurative with the oil and cold wax. And um, so it's more nature, emotions, people. And so that influences my work quite a bit. Do you ever experience a creative block in making a work where you just are unsure of where you're headed next? I, I often, experience uh, block. Um, it is more of self-doubt than block. I mean, I sometimes I will get so frustrated with my paintings and I think, what the heck am I thinking? What do, why am I doing this? And I think abstract painting is the hardest. I mean, we know when a pair looks like a pair, but when are you done with an abstract painting? And and when is it right? And so all of that um, really bothers me. And then I just quit painting for a while and think maybe I'll bake more or do something. Or, so I really have a problem with that. But I mean, then I pick how, it right back. Yeah, I was going to say, how do you overcome that? What do you have any any ritual or trigger that helps you move back towards painting when you're struggling? I am a huge learner, a lifelong learner, probably that says why I developed the Lifelong Learning Institute, because 
I am such a learner. I study um, two hours a day. I, I can lose myself. The internet has not been good for me. It just keeps me glued to all these websites and all the creativity. So I start looking at other people's websites. I, I look at um, old masters. I do a lot of things. I study um, color, color theory. I study um, all different theories of art because my background isn't in art. So the fundamentals I've had to learn on my own. And I take classes all the time just in fundamentals on color theory or or um, composition. Well, in reference to um, experiencing creative block and overcoming that, how has the pandemic affected your art making practice? With the pandemic, um, I sort of stopped dead in my tracks. Um, it just seemed like the world had tipped upside down. And it was like, what's the point? I had all the time in the world, but it was just, it sort of took the wind out of my sails for a while. And then um, I, other artists and I would be online talking or on the phone talking. And, and we all sort of kicked each other and said, let's get going back at it again. And so that helped, it helped a lot. How would you describe your role as a creative in your community? You know, the, um, the art center in Clear Lake was one of the reasons we moved to Clear Lake. Um, when we were moving to Iowa, we were going to move to Forest City and I went in the art center in Clear Lake and it was in the summer and the baskets were outside and it was the old art center. And I thought, oh, this is a great community. We have an art center and we have flower baskets. There's creative people here. And so we then um, ended up moving to Clear Lake. And um, it also was uh, equidistance from two plants my husband was running, but I, I thought it was a creative area. And, but I, when I started painting, I do it for myself. So I wasn't about to get it out there or do anything. And, and I kept being asked to be part of Art on the Plaza. Um, and I, I just said, thanks, but no thanks. And I was asked to be involved in the Clear Lake Arts Center, which I've been involved in the Arts Center, but not putting any of my paintings in. And then um, Nyack asked if I would have a show and I was working at Nyack. And I thought, you know, I need to step it up and, and be involved with this because being part of the Lifelong Learning Institute, there were a lot of people there that would go to the show and then they would know where to go. And then they would go to some other artist show the next time and another artist. So I thought I was being selfish. So I had a show at Nyack and then I joined Art on the Plaza and I put some things at the Art, uh, the art Center in Clear Lake. And, and I feel that is supportive of other artists. So in the community, I think it's very important for artists to support artists and help with their creativity. Well, let's talk about um, some of your, your favorite things in the art world and uh, your practice. Do you have any artists right now that you're excited about or that you feel influence um, your art making or your process? Well, Rebecca Crowell, who I always call the queen of cold wax. She teaches internationally and has written a book on the subject. Um, her art in oil and cold wax is shown in galleries across the country and her art changes a lot. And I, I learned from her initially and, and from Jim Sherbar. And so I always follow them. Um, Laura Murphy is in Ireland, but she does um, encaustic art, mostly portrait painting. And I love her work and her choice of colors. 
And so I'm looking at a lot of um, portraits now and figurative because I want to try to add that more into my cold wax. So it's just a new direction I'm trying to go. Could you explain a little bit um, what the difference is between oil and cold wax and what encaustic painting is? Sure, sure. Um, I use oil and cold wax. And as I said, uh, cold wax is like butter or looks like lard and you mix it. Um, and encaustic is a hot wax. So you heat up the wax oils and you heat up the wax, mixing it all together. Um, I love encaustic. I love the look of encaustic. I love the painterly feel of encaustic but you need a lot of um, uh, ventilation when you're doing encaustic. And as I, I, you know, I paint in the unfinished part of my basement in Clear Lake next to the furnace. I don't think that would be good for encaustic. And I paint in my garage in Arizona. So again, I don't have that ventilation system. You've uh, referred to color a couple of times. One, you, you've talked about color theory. And um, I was wondering, do you have a favorite color you like to work with? I do. I like um, black. I usually add black to almost every painting. I'm thinking what I have behind me. And I like reds a lot. And um, I think that red is exciting and it's that pop of color. Uh, black just centers it for me and it just brings it it's sort of the it's the the rock that holds it down how about uh tools do you have any favorite tools that you work with uh in your process that you couldn't live without <laughs> well each cold, oil and cold wax artist has their own favorites and as i said i don't use brushes very often unless it's maybe a wisp broom or something like that we usually use um, brayers. This is a brayer. And um, let me see, I have so many tools. Nothing is sacred. And I go out to the tool bench and steal from that and use things out of the kitchen drawers and they never go back. This is a Messermeister. Looks, looks like something you would use for cleaning a bowl. I think it might be, but that's one of my favorites and um, scrapers of all different sizes and shapes and mark making tools. I have so many tools, it's unbelievable. So, and if I go to an antique shop or a Goodwill, I'm always looking for just that thing that can, you know, like the basting brush. Oh, I love that for using solvents, those basting brushes. So, you know, nothing sacred. You never have too many tools. You can't. Well, thank you uh, for uh, sharing a little bit about that with us today. I'll give you um, a tour of my tiny little garage studio. If anyone ever says they don't have room to paint, you, this will prove you wrong. Now, let me get this. Um, I'll step back. You can, can you see it? No, oh, okay. Oh, wait, I have to turn it around. I'm sorry, that's why. There. There you go. Here is my studio. You can see my furnaces and my water softener. And this little area is my studio. It's as clean as it's been in forever. And I pulled out some paintings to make you think that I am working right now, but these are all paintings I've done out here in Arizona. Um, and you'll see, I'll show you closely, some of the depth that you can get with oil and cold wax. And you can see how I've scraped and I don't know how good this, this is, but um, that gives you an idea. This one you asked about community. This painting just won for best of show in an art show here in the Valley. So 
And again, there's the black and you see a little red going on. But my studio, I have, um, it's, I paint on the wall. I have a little system of, of little screws that I've put in on these. Uh, I have pegboard, but then I have screws and I hang all my things because they're hard, hard wood. Those are wood panels. And then I use this area is my palette. It's a sort of a mess I was adding right now. It always looks like this. And here are tools I'm using. I usually have gloves on. I use, uh, try to wear different shoes because I get them just solid. I wear gloves, wear apron. I'll have paint all over my face. I had two paintings that look just the same, this one and this one. And this morning, and they were boring. They didn't have enough um, value um, and contrast of value. They were just boring. And I was doing them as a diptych last year. They were just dull. So I started on this one and I added some more paint. Now this will, you'll never recognize it when it's done because I will change it totally and keep adding, adding layers in different ways. You can see there's a light orange and then a bright orange. And so it just keeps going. Different layers, different textures and different depths. So gives you an idea, but it's all done in this little tiny, there's my golf cart, little tiny space. It works just fine. Works fine. So no one can say they don't have the space. So I usually don't have all these. These are done. So I pulled them out so you could see an end product. But I usually don't have there. I always have, um, I have artists or art from um, all different stages because I usually work on about five at a time because of the drying time in between. And sometimes we have what we call our angry teenagers. They're sort of in the middle and they look like heck. You don't know what you're gonna do with them. And, and then you have to decide when they're finished. So both of these that I'm showing right now are finished for the moment. I've been known to take an old panel like these and start all over. So that's my space.